Okay, we're ready for the second speaker in the second session, and that is Corey Curtis. And she'll be speaking on spatially and temporally dynamic humpback feeding areas in Antarctica. Thank you. Go for it. Okay, excellent. Thanks. Um, so as he said, I'm Corey Curtis. I'm with the Marine Geospatial Ecology Lab at Duke University. Um, and the work that I'm presenting uh, was primarily done by um, Dr. Ari Friedlander, Dr. David Johnson, Dr. Patrick Halpin, who's here. I can throw him under the bus at the end for any hard questions. Um, Nick Gales and Hugh Ducklow, they were the folks that actually traveled and did the research. Um, I am a uh, research analyst in the lab, so I, I get the data after the fact, after they've done the fun trips. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, humpback whale feeding ecology, and I'll discuss our data collection and research objectives, which involve um, moving home ranges over time, and present our preliminary results and what our next steps are, um, and maybe even hopefully get some feedback from the group. So humpback whales are part of the Balaenopteridae family. Um, they're the largest predator on the planet and present in all the oceans. They migrate between low latitude breeding areas and high latitude feeding areas. Um, and so the data that I'm going to show you today is related to the humpback whales that move between uh, the western Antarctic Peninsula and the western coast of South America. What you can see on the map is um, in blue, all of that blue is the range of the humpback whales throughout all the oceans. And then the green are the cold water feeding areas and the yellow are the warm water breeding areas. So here's a closer look at the study area, the Western Antarctic Peninsula, which is just um, south of the tip of South America. And you can clearly see the, the shelf break here in the picture. And all the data that we are looking at for this project is within that shelf break. Um, part of the big thing of what we're looking at down here is involves the seasonal ice movement. And what you can see is that um, in the height of winter, which is in September, um, the sea ice moves in and covers all of these little bays and these little nooks and crannies around the peninsula. And then during summer, which is in February, the sea ice retreats. So like I said, baleen whales are the largest uh, predators on Earth. They interestingly evolved to feed on very small prey by engulfing large amounts of water containing the prey and then filtering that water out through their, through their baleen. Antarctic humpback whales feed primarily on Antarctic krill. And so the research that I'm talking about today is looking at um, the changes in space use from summer over into fall and winter as the krill move and how the whales follow and respond to that krill movement. What we appear to be seeing is that um, in early summer, the whales are moving um, in, in a large scale effort along and off the shore here. Um, and then as the season progresses into late summer and early fall, what we believe we're seeing is the whales are coming closer into shore and they're coming into these smaller areas. We think this change is driven by um, that prey movement. And so here's an Antarctic krill. Um, they're tiny shrimp-like crustaceans that grow to about six centimeters and live in swarms of about 10,000 to 30,000 krill per cubic meter. Those swarms can extend over kilometers, and they can contain many billions of individuals. So just to look briefly now at that krill movement, because what we're trying to look at is how the whales move in response to that krill movement. During the summer, the krill are dispersed widely over um, the entire area. So this is closer into shore. Here's a shelf break, and then this is the deeper offshore waters. The female krill move offshore, and they're laying eggs probably throughout the entire summer, which is about December through March. Those eggs sink through the water column, and then they start to um, develop into, into larvae, and they start to ascend back up through the water column. As the sea ice progresses further out from shore, and encompasses the bays, the larvae hang out 
under that um, sea ice. It's both for protection and for feeding. They fill on that, they feed on that sea ice community under there. Um, and in late winter through early spring, those larvae grow to become juveniles. And both the juveniles and the adults stay under the sea ice during the winter months, um, and particularly during the late winter months when primary productivity offshore is much less. They're um, both being protected by the ice from krill eating predators, and they're feeding on um, some of the algae that's under the sea ice. So that relationship between uh, the krill and the humpback whales um, has led us to ask two questions for this research. The first one is, are the whales decreasing their broad search area as the season progresses from summer into fall and winter? And as the krill are moving from offshore and the krill are moving into shore, do they also um, decrease their foraging high use areas? So are they foraging much more focused in smaller areas as the krill are swarming in smaller areas closer into shore? So to get a better sense of the whale movement um, while the whales are foraging, a team in 2012, a team of researchers from Duke University, Oregon State University, Columbia University, and uh, the Australian government went to the Western Antarctic Peninsula to tag whales. This picture is actually um, in the winter months, not in the summer months, but it gives you a sense of the, some of the conditions that they can run into down there. The crew live aboard a very large research vessel, but they use these smaller, uh, rigid hulled inflatable skiffs to approach the whales so that they can get close enough to tag them. Generally, that's a distance of about three to eight meters. And when they get that close, they use a compressed air gun um, to deploy the tag into the whale's blubber. So the team used uh, SPOT-5 satellite tags. And while they were down there in the summer of 2012, they tagged six whales. So in this picture, you can see uh, the container that holds uh, the tag. And then you can see it's been deployed into the whale. And you can see just right there the antenna sticking up out of the um, whales, extending past the surface of the whale skin. Humpback whales tend to spend most of their time below the surface of the water, diving to feed. Um, and the tags are only going to transmit when the whale is at the surface of the water. So to conserve batteries, these tags for this um, project were programmed to transmit on a four-hour on, eight-hour off duty cycle. You can see I only have five here. One of the tags stopped transmitting after three days, so we didn't use it in the rest of the research. The rest of the tags lasted from 38 to 140 days, and the, the total span is about 162 days. Um, I did apply the Freitas speed distance angle filter to reduce the locations. Um, the speed distance angle filter should remove um, some of the likely erroneous locations that you get from the Argos data. So what you can see here are the, the resulting tracks of the data that we got. And what we can see is that the boat was moving while it was tagging. And we can see the initial tag on on January 3rd right here. And then the boat moved south and put the second tag on on January 19th. And the third tag on January 27th. And then it came back up to just about the same starting point and put the last two tags on on January 30th and January 31st. What I'm trying to get a sense of is the, the moving distribution of the high use areas of these whales over time. So what we did was we used a new product kernel method from Keating and Cherry. And this method extends the traditional kernel density to include um, an additional time dimension, T. And you could also use um, a Z dimension, which could be altitude or depth, if you had that kind of data. So what we did was we used the full, whoops, we used the full 162-day time span to create 95% uh, kernel density estimators. We, used, um, we created those UDs on every fifth day. So it was centered on a particular date. And then it has a, a smoothing parameter for time, very similar to the smoothing parameter that you have in your x and your y dimension. Um, and I used a five-day smoothing parameter for that. We next. Um, 
subtracted out any land from those resulting polygons, and we calculated the total area for all the polygons on one day for one whale. So you're looking at one whale here, 112699. And so one day we would take all the polygons, the little high use areas that resulted on that day, and we'd sum the area of those. The color scale shows the movement from uh, the yellows into the pinks and reds, and then up into the purples, and eventually into the blues. That's the movement over time. The next thing we did was we calculated the centroids for all of these polygons. Um, and we took the distance of each of these polygons to the mainland. So this is what we considered the mainland in here, not these outlying islands. So we were looking how far the whales were traveling from the main part of the continent. So lastly, um, the other thing that we wanted to get a sense of was the change in spread of use over time. So we used those previous centroids that we had created from the, the little individual um, high intensity areas. We used those centroids and we created minimum convex polygons. So again, this is going to be every fifth day um, over the whole time frame. Um, the color coding here is the lighter is earlier in the season and then the darker is later in the season. And our hypothesis is that as the whales are moving in smaller and smaller areas, those MCPs it will also get smaller in area. So here's a little animation that's going to show you um, color-coded by whale over time. Is it playing? OK. Color-coded by whale over time. Um, there's the date that you're looking at, and it's every five days. So there's January 13. It's playing when it wants to. OK, there's January 19, January 24. So what you can see is there's additional whale data coming in as the tags are going on. And you can see, <laughs> and you can see that they're moving over time. <laughs> I don't know why it doesn't like me. Ah, OK. Let's try that again. OK, I won't touch. So they're moving over time. And what you'll see is as the tags go on, you'll see the next color come in. There's the red. And then you'll see the blue and the green come in. And then lastly, the purple come in. And so what we're seeing is earlier in the season, they're, they're kind of further off away from the mainland. And they're fairly widely distributed in how far apart those high intensity or high use areas are from each other. And what we're looking at is, or what we're hoping to see, is that as we go into April, <coughs> May, and June, they get to be closer together and smaller in area. Um, so to test our hypotheses, we used linear mixed effects models. Um, and as predictors, we used Julian date, month, and distance to shore for fixed effects. Um, and we let the PTT be the random effect. We tested both the area of those combined kernel densities and also the area of those minimum convex polygons. What we found to be, oh, um, to test for significance, uh, we took our potential um, mixed effects models and compared them against the null model to see whether or not any of the predictors were significant from the null model. So for total home range area, um, the combination of month plus distance to shore turned out to be the, um, the strongest model. And what that showed was that as the months increased and the distance to shore decreased, the home range areas decreased by 215 square kilometers. For the minimum convex polygons, um, month by itself was the strongest predicting model. And the, those minimum convex poly polygons decreased in area um, by 1,600 square kilometers per month which e with each increase. So we see evidence to support our hypotheses. Um, so for next steps, this was sort of a preliminary data set. This was only six tags and a short duration. Um, we also have data from 2013 for more humpback whales and also for minke whales. That's a richer data set. There's more tags, and there's uh, longer durations for the tags. We also want to take a look at um, density estimates. There's a new method from Whitehead and Johnson 
that lets you estimate the density of the animals from telemetry tracks. So we want to try um, applying that to our data. Uh, I just want to, again, thank the co-authors who are actually the real researchers on this project. I just get the data and sit in front of my computer while they get to go to Antarctica. Although, based on that picture, I'm not sure I <laughs> want to go. Um, we were, um, received funding from the, from the NSF Long-Term Ecological Research Network at the Palmer Station and from the Australian Antarctic Division, the Australian government. So thank you very much. Okay. So I, I mean, I have a question for the group, for folks who've done this before. Is there a better way of, of um, getting an assessment of that spread of the animals? I mean, I thought about using, it's mostly um, latitudinal, so I could use that with the points, but it seemed a little hokey just to take those minimum convex polygons from these centroids. I don't know if anybody's looked at things like that before. Okay. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> uh, are there quantitative estimates that are still though? I mean, the hypothesis sounds great, yeah. but you know, the direction of the actual test is kind of better than worse. Yeah, yeah. So they've done a couple of other cruises. One of which was called uh, Mishap, which I forget what it stood for, but it stood for the fact that they had um, a big boat that had um, uh, echolocators on it, and they were measuring krill density. And they were putting suction cup D tags on the whales, so they were able to model their 3D um, movement underwater, including lunges. And so we did some work to look at the intersection of that prey data field that they had and when the whales were lunging. So they have quantifiable estimates of how big the krill patch sizes are, how deep they are when they're doing that, that kind of thing. Yeah. No, so that's an important fact. The way the, um, so the whales don't forage once they leave their foraging areas, or at least not that we know of. They go up and they breed, and that's separate from their foraging area. So they need to acquire a large amount of resources in order to make that migration, breed, and then come back again the next season. Yeah, bulk up. It's what I do over the winter, too, so. <laughs> <laughs>